Did the first rays of morning light gently awaken you, filling your heart with a boundless zeal to embrace happiness and revel in joy? A worthy pursuit, to be sure. But did you also yearn for serene tranquility, a refuge from the burdens of pain and strife? In our fragile vessels traversing this imperfect world, it is only natural that we may, from time to time, experience such emotions. You may not realize it, but in some cases, you may have the case of Epicureanism. My name is Jared Luchibor, a graduate of Mid-America Reform Seminary and a lover of church history. Join me as we survey the second of the core philosophical systems at play during the time of the early church, Epicureanism, its desire for pleasure, freedom from fear, and longing for community. All of this today in this episode of The Church History Project. The philosophical school known as Epicureanism traces its origins to the mind of the ancient Greek thinker Epicurus. In the city of Athens around the year 307 BC, Epicurus established a place of contemplation and teaching, gathering like-minded students who wished to learn from their master. There, in tranquil gardens where discourse flowed as freely as wine, Epicurus expounded his views on ethics, friendship, and the true path to happiness. Central to their view was the idea that limiting one's desires and achieving contentment with simple pleasures leads to a state of ataraxia, or freedom from disturbance and fear. Excessive desires for power, wealth, and sensory indulgence were seen as the source of anxiety and suffering. The Epicureans taught that by tempering desires, focusing on friendship, leading a prudent life, and cultivating an attitude of gratitude for what one has, deep and abiding happiness could be obtained. Their ideal was to reach a state of aponia, or the absence of pain and tranquility of the soul. Moderation, not extremes, was key. While not rejecting material comforts outright, the Epicureans emphasized deriving pleasure from simple things, a meal with friends, a walk in nature, contemplation of philosophical truths. Prudence and wisdom were esteemed as the surest path to happiness. Self-sufficiency was also important, as relying too much on external things for happiness made one psychologically vulnerable. The Epicureans urged their followers to gain inner freedom by limiting needs, avoiding fear and anxiety about the future, and relying on oneself for contentment. Their teaching showed that luxury does not guarantee happiness, but wisdom, virtue, and serenity of mind do. Even in a world of modest means, the Epicureans believed a rich and fulfilling life was possible for those who cultivated the proper outlook. Rather than seeking power or riches, the Epicureans encouraged their adherents to withdraw from the tumult of public affairs. They saw involvement in politics as an unnecessary source of anxiety and distress. Why entangle oneself in the messy business of governing when true contentment is to be found through philosophical conversation in the shade of a flowering garden? The hackles and clamor of the agora, or marketplace, could not perturb the sage ensconced safely behind the walls of his homely abode. There, he could cultivate his small circle of friends and let the wider world of strife and ambition unfold as it would. For the Epicureans, the recipe for a life well lived was simple. Find a few trustworthy companions, engage in regular philosophical discussions to sharpen the mind and uplift the spirit, and remain removed from the commotion of politics and public affairs. Surrounded by friendship, sustained by contemplation, the wise Epicurean could construct a shelter for the soul amidst the storms of life. The Epicureans were known for their astute intellect and studied the application of logic. They firmly believed that rational analysis could unlock mysteries and reveal life's subtleties. Moreover, they recognized how faulty thinking breeds irrational fears that plague the mind. 
In essence, the Epicureans, guided by their resolute commitment to sound reasoning and logical contemplation, sought not only to comprehend the universe's subtlest workings, but also to liberate the human spirit from the shackles of anxiety and dread, thereby embracing a life of serene harmony and understanding. In contemplating the world around them, the Epicureans developed an insightful theory of the physical world. They proposed that all matter is composed of imperceptibly small, indivisible particles called atoms. These perpetually moving atoms stream through the void of empty space. The Epicureans believed that the particular motions and collision of atoms could account for the tremendous diversity of objects and phenomena in nature. According to their atomistic worldview, the sensations we experience and the thoughts we think ultimately have their origins in the intricate dances of atoms. Though their ideas were speculative for their time, the Epicurean's atomic theory was a bold and thoughtful forerunner to modern understandings of matter and mind. In contrast to the physical world, in the verdant gardens of Athens, Epicurus would have pontificated on the nature of divinity before his disciples. The enlightened philosopher saw that men toiled under the yoke of superstition, fearing the petty wraths of anthropomorphic gods. He understood that this was the product of ignorance, and sought to liberate the human mind through rational thought. Epicurus declared that the gods do indeed exist, However, they dwell in a blissful state of tranquility, perfectly content and needing nothing. The affairs of men could not perturb such beings. We have nothing to fear or beg from the gods. They remain in their faraway abodes while we walk the earth according to nature's dictates. According to Epicurus, this simple truth can free man from irrational terrors of divine retribution. The ancient Epicurean philosophers held that the human soul, being composed entirely of atoms like the rest of the material world, must dissolve upon the death of the body. For them, the notion of an eternal afterlife was but a superstition. While many then and now find the prospect of oblivion terrifying, the Epicureans embraced it as liberating. Freed from anxieties about judgment and punishment after death, we can focus on seeking pleasure and avoiding pain in the here and now. These men urge their followers not to fret about what may come hereafter, for when it arrives, they shall not be present to suffer it. Therefore, they were taught to soak up each joyous moment under the sun, surround themselves with good friends, feast on delicious foods, and engage in meaningful work. And soon enough, they shall close their eyes for the last time atoms dispersing to become part of new wholes. But while they lived, they were to live well, unburdened by irrational fears. The ancient philosophy of Epicureanism, with its focus on pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain, presents some thoughtful critiques of religion and death. Yet, for Christians rooted in the truth of Scripture, the Epicurean worldview proves spiritually deficient. While we can appreciate the desire to avoid unnecessary fear and suffering, as followers of Christ, we are called to a life of meaning beyond individual pleasure. At its heart, Epicureanism advocates an individualistic pursuit of happiness, often manifested in the pleasure of food, comforts, and friendships. While Christians, too, can delight in earthly joys and community, our ultimate satisfaction stems not from ourselves, but from bringing glory to God. An Epicurean seeks to gratify their own desires. A Christian seeks to align their desires with God's will, trusting that He orders all things well. Certainly, the Epicurean critique of irrational fears holds wisdom the Christian can affirm. Superstitions and false ideas about death deserve to be dispelled. We need not fear death because Christ has conquered the grave. Yet where the Epicurean sees chance and randomness, the Christian sees divine providence unfolding. Our God remains intimately sovereign over every aspect of life. Though the Epicurean lifestyle may appear carefree, at root, it lacks the lasting joy and purpose that Christians can know in Christ. Because our citizenship is in heaven, we can experience hope and contentment even amid earthly suffering. 
our pleasure is not confined to the present. For the Christian, true delight comes when our lives point to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. He alone provides the way, the truth, and the life. In the end, we recognize the merits of some Epicurean insights, but its worldview proves spiritually dead. When our lives are firmly rooted in the gospel, we find a pleasure infinitely beyond earthly comforts. Our purpose transcends ourselves. By God's grace, we are called to glorify Him in all that we do, living for the eternal joy set before us in Christ. In Acts chapter 17, verse 18, we read that while Paul preached in Athens, some of the Epicurean philosophers also conversed with him. But it was not just the Epicureans that Paul encountered. Join me next time as we look at the third philosophy of the Roman Empire, Stoicism. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you. Feel free to reach out through social media platforms or through email, which you can find in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. And if you enjoyed today's discussion, consider leaving a review. I'm Jared Luchibor. This has been an episode of The Church History Project.